Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we continue on with the mechanic slash chemist who is out to prove a young earth. Let's see how he does this time. Also, as you can see in this next transparency, from Canada into the United States, all this red area is called Precambian rock. That is a very American-centric map of the Canadian Shield. I like this one better. Yes, that is a formation of Precambian rock, more properly known as Precambrian rock. This is where you'll find some of the oldest rocks on the planet, and a lot of the Precambrian rock has been uplifted and younger rock eroded away to a point where the older rock is exposed on the surface. Geologic inversion, I think that was called. This is rock that's even older than 600,000, 600 million years. And the younger rock is underneath it. Yeah, inversion. It happens. In other words, the whole thing is turned upside down. No, it's not upside down. If you dig through the Precambrian rock of the Canadian Shield, you don't find younger rock buried beneath it. It's just that if you move laterally, you will sometimes find layers of younger rock deposited lower than the Precambrian rock that is beside it. Basic mistake, easy enough to understand, inversion usually means something that has been flipped completely upside down, but you're wrong, and it's not hard to find this information. So if you didn't do enough digging, pun intended, to figure out what geologists mean when they say inversion as opposed to lay people, then how can we trust your other scientific conclusions, or rather unscientific conclusions? Actually, there's only one place in the world that you can go to consistently find, consistently see, these layers of rock is laid out. You know where it's at? There are two locations that I am aware of, so you're likely to either say North Dakota or Australia. Either that, or you're just mindlessly parroting other creationists, and you're about to say, in the textbooks. In the books. Yeah, I'm not sure why I expected better of you. I should have known better than that. I told you, they're good at making fascinating drawings of things that don't exist. Good one. It will take me a while to recover from that sick burn. That is not science. Says the mechanic pretending to be a chemist who misunderstands basic geological terminology. They say this, that over millions of years ago, there were worms living at the bottom of the oceans and the seas. But through millions of years and some favorable accidents, some of them changed into fish. Kind of? Not really, though. More favorable accidents and more millions and millions of years, some of them changed into amphibians as a frog. With more favorable accidents and millions of years, some of them changed into primates, then into chimpanzee, and finally into our professor of biology. Nope. I mean, you sort of have the gist of it. Over millions of years, small adaptations accumulate, making the descendants quite different from their ancestors, leading to, say, a fish with lungs that can walk and live outside of water. Sounds far-fetched, I know, but the thing is, the ray-finned version of that fish exists. Like, today. As in, you can go to a fish store and buy one to put in your aquarium right now. Just make sure you read about them first, they're not the easiest guys to take care of. But these fish have been successfully raised terrestrially by scientists. That is, they raised them on land. And as a bonus, due to a biological mechanism known as phenotypic plasticity, within one generation, there was relatively large-scale change that helped them adapt to life on land. If that's not a transitional species, I don't know what is. But also, humans and chimps are cousins. Chimps are not our ancestors. We share a common ancestor with them, but they are not that ancestor. Now, for evolution, millions of years is indispensable for, by chance, happenings that this evolutionary process can take place. Well, it's also indispensable to allow enough time for all the organisms that we have direct fossil evidence for to have existed. Like, remember being buried by three feet of crinoids? Now look at the nearly global chalk beds which are formed from the remains of coccolithophores, and are about 1.5 kilometers thick. They can be found all over the world. Just looking at these two formations, we have just two categories of animals that wouldn't have been able to coexist due to a severe lack of resources. But with the creation hypothesis, these two categories of animal had to coexist all at one time in their entirety with every other category of animal from the history of the planet as well. 
spread their existence out over a few tens of millions of years, and it's not a problem. He insists that they all died in the flood of Noah, and we don't just have a boat with too many animals on it, we have too many animals existing simultaneously, period. Obviously, if I had a worm here and say that at the end of my talk, this would be a professor of biology, say you're making fun of the biologist. No, I'd say that's a completely invalid comparison. But if I showed you a microscopic tadpole looking thing and told you that it could turn into a human baby in nine months, that is quite the drastic little transition there. But it happens all the time. But that's also an invalid comparison. It just serves to demonstrate that the absurdity of transforming a worm into a human isn't quite as absurd as creationists would have you believe. Like, seriously, have you ever seen semen? It is a gross, slimy puddle of goo. And yet this puddle of slimy goo is capable of transforming into a human within a period of months. But the idea that humanity could have evolved from something like a slimy puddle of goo over hundreds of millions of years is just too big a leap, apparently. But if I say over a period of millions and millions of years, the worm became a professor of biology, you say, oh, that's quite believable. Again, no, because no individual organism transforms itself into a different kind or species or type or whatever other term you want to use. It's just differences between parents and their children accumulated over time. Anyway, let's take a look at some clocks. One of the first clocks that we have is the Delta at the end of the great river Mississippi by New Orleans that empties out into the Gulf of Mexico. The Mississippi River Delta, the delta whose origins are in the Cretaceous period some 100 million years ago, that delta? How is that going to help you demonstrate that the Earth is only 6,000 years old? I mean, sure, the modern version of the delta is about 8,000 years old, which generally fits into the six to 10,000 year range that creationists give to the Earth, but its geologic history goes back 100 million years. Now, those in search of oil have drilled both in the Gulf of Mexico as well as into the continental USA, which means into that landmass which comprises the delta. Now, they observe what is deposited dirt, what is virgin dirt, as they drill down into the ground. What exactly is virgin dirt as opposed to deposited dirt? There is a song by a band called Let Live titled Version Dirt, and I found an article about a soil scientist on a mission to preserve areas in the U.S. where the soil remains unaffected by humans, but virgin dirt doesn't seem to be a geologic term. And so they get, from that we can know how extensive was the delta, how deep it was, how much dirt is deposited there. Also, we can measure how much water is flowing and sediments bringing. And you compare the present-day measurement of the rate of deposition, extrapolate that into the past as if it's a constant, ignore erosion, and find that this leaves us with an age for the delta of 4,000 years because otherwise the deposition would extend farther into the ocean or something. Am I right? Uh, I read one figure that some 30,000 ton, 30, tons of dirt are brought down every hour. And so with those things put together, we calculate find that the whole delta, this is what a delta looks like, it's when a river flows into a larger body of, water of water. Guys, if you ever wonder why I script my videos out in advance, it's because I would sound almost as bad as this if I were just speaking off the cuff. Buddy here really needs a script. The water slows and the sediments it carries begin to accumulate forming that landmass called a delta. This whole Mississippi River Delta could have been formed in six to 10,000 years. What? Really? You think the delta formed before the flood? How did it survive the flood? How is it not buried in all the sediment that the flood was supposed to have laid down? You pointed out yourself earlier that the Grand Canyon is over a mile deep. It's 1.83 kilometers deep at its deepest. And most of it is made of sedimentary rock, the sediments deposited in Noah's flood, according to creationists. But here you are saying that the Mississippi River Delta is six to 10,000 years old, meaning that it formed before the flood and somehow managed to remain constant through the flood? If it formed that long ago, shouldn't it be buried under a couple kilometers of rock layers? Now, mind you, they don't take into consideration that there had been a worldwide flood after the which maybe half of that Delta uh, Earth had come down in the first hundred years or so. Oh, okay, I get it. You think there were differing rates of deposition. The accepted age of the modern delta is 7,500 to 8,000 years. That's fairly young, geologically speaking, but it's too old for your flood. So half of its deposition happened quickly in the first hundred years after the flood. 
So how do you explain the six delta complexes that are found there, which have each been explained by geologists through normal geologic processes? There are two pre-flood and four post-flood. Would you suggest that two of them happened in the first century after the flood, and then the other four happened in the time frame that we generally accept? Because that seems rather arbitrary, almost like it's a post hoc rationalization of your a priori beliefs. It indicates a young Earth. What is the oldest living thing on Earth today? The short answer is that we don't know for sure because we haven't done an exhaustive survey of every individual organism on the planet. But the oldest individual organism that we know of is a bristlecone pine that is over 5,065 years old. The oldest clonal organism that we know of is the Pando forest in Utah, whose root system is about 80,000 years old. And if we include dormant in our definition of living, we found dormant bacterial spores in the gut of a bee that was encased in amber some 25 to 40 million years ago, and we were able to successfully revive them. So depending on what you count, the oldest living organism was either 5,000 years old, 80,000 years old, or 25 million years old. Now sure, the bacterial spores in the bee could have survived through the flood, so we can ignore that one. But both the Pando forest and the bristlecone pine would have been destroyed in the flood. Since they are both older than the flood, that means the flood did not happen, at least not on the timescale that you are claiming. Please, no family jokes or things of that nature. The oldest living thing is called the bristlecone pine. It's also called the Methuselah pine. It is about 4,300 years old. Yeah, it's not surprised that he's working from old data on that one, seeing as how old this video is. The tree that he's referring to is no longer the oldest known living bristlecone pine, with the one that I am referring to having been discovered in 2012. Whoa, what happened 4,300 years ago? Well, according to the Bible, there was a worldwide flood. Yep, and according to science, a bunch of organisms survived through that worldwide flood, and a bunch of human cultures. So I'm going to go with old book full of myths being wrong on this one. They completely revamped all the real estate. Plants, animals, and people began to populate the earth about 4,400 years ago. Interesting. How come we don't have anything living older than 4,300 years? Well, we do, but even if we didn't, that wouldn't prove anything. 4,000 years is a long time for us biological organisms. Most things don't live anywhere near that long. This line of evidence is like looking at the oldest living human, Kane Tanaka, seeing that she is 117 years old, and declaring that humanity has only been around for 117 years, because the oldest living human is 117 years old. What happened 117 years ago that wiped out all the humans? Must have been a flood. Nah, people just usually die before that, that's all. Nothing special there. Maybe most organisms on the planet die before reaching 4,000 years old. Did that thought occur to you? Oh yeah, and also, I let him get away with the bristlecone pine thing earlier because he was working from old data, but as it turns out, Methuselah, the tree that he is referring to, is actually about 4,800 years old. So, flood being 4,400 years ago, it survived the flood as well. And they're about 4,000 years old. Now, what's the reason that the bristlecone pine and the sequoia trees are so old. Two reasons. One is their resistance to plant diseases, as well as their resistance to forest fires. You're right. It's almost like there are things that happen that tend to kill things before they can reach great ages like that, and it takes a particularly resilient organism to survive that long, meaning that only having a handful of organisms that reach great ages like that is the norm indicates a young earth. No, it indicates a couple of old trees. Another clock that indicates a young earth is the world's population. Oh god, no, don't. Your arguments are already pathetic enough as it is without having to go to the argument that assumes that humanity would keep expanding indefinitely regardless of resource availability, disease, war, and any other population limiting factors. Like Seriously, this argument is completely debunked by the existence of disease and the scarcity of resources. So I'm just going to go ahead and skip right past it. Actually, I'll save the skipping for the next segment. That's enough of him for today. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Neko Ajik, who says, When they say that we're going to learn something new from the Bible, I hear them saying that they're going to massage whatever new we're going to learn into the text. When you have a text that's so vague, you can read into it pretty much anything you like. 
couple of things. Firstly, yeah, I generally agree that when a preacher or apologist says it, this is likely where they're headed. But it is entirely possible for a scholar or historian to learn something new about an ancient culture from a text. But more to the point, ancient rabbis tended to be of the opinion that a text was only useful so long as it could be reinterpreted in new ways and new meanings could be found. I'm not sure if that tradition goes back to when Genesis was first written down, but if it does, then it is entirely possible that the original authors never intended it to be just a plain reading literal text, and they would be appalled at the way young earth creationists insist on interpreting it. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, and What Jesus, who are the deltas that keep the building up of deposition that is my channel going. If you'd like to be muddy forking water, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!